Welcome, everyone. Um, and just so you know, I believe, Lena, you're recording this webinar. So just for everyone's information uh, yes. from the beginning. Um, I'm so welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here to learn more about shared decision making, along with our guests, Annette McKinnon, Dr. Claire Barber. And is Glenn joining us, Claire? Or is he at home? going to text him. He's okay. <laughs> uh, hopefully Dr. Glenn Hayes-Lewitt and Dr. Karen Toupin april So just a few housekeeping notes. This webinar will be about an hour long. It will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. We will also be using Slido. So this is because we're going to be asking you to participate in the beginning of the webinar. You know, I think we've all been through a lot of different Zoom meetings. And so I just wanted to make it a little more interactive so we can, you know, hopefully keep everyone's attention a little bit more. Um, your answers will be recorded, but not your identity. And then we hope to you know, post these to our website after the webinar. So first up, we'll be having a fireside chat with Kappa board member Annette McKinnon. So welcome, Annette. Um, this will be followed by 15-minute presentations by Drs. Claire Barber and Glenn Hazelwood, as well as another 15-minute presentation by Dr. Corinne Toupin April. So feel free to add your questions too to the chat as we go along or as you think about them, and we'll try to look at them. You know, at the hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes at the end to reserve for, for questions and answers. So, um, so yeah, just those few housekeeping bits. So, um, so, so like I said, um, we have Annette McKinnon up first. We'll be having a fireside chat about what shared decision making means. So she is a fellow Kappa board member. Um, and after 30 years experience as a patient with RA and the health system, she decided to make use of what she has learned to help others. She's involved at her local hospital on the community advisory council, as well as a health mentor for the center for for interprofessional education and is quite actively involved as an understatement, I think, on several research teams. So thanks so much, Annette, uh, for being here. Oh, thank you. So, uh, I mean, and so, yes, here, let me move to my slides here. So <laughs> shared decision-making, so the fireside chat here to begin. So um, shared decision-making is said to be a process in which clinicians and patients work together to um, you know, decide on treatments, select tests and treatments and care plans based on clinical evidence that balances risks and expected outcomes with patient preferences and values. Um, and I know myself as a patient partner, you know, I really see, um, or, or you know, as a patient who's lived with JIA for the majority of my life, you know, I really see it as um, you know, synonymous with care that suits my needs. Patient-centered care is something that a lot of people have talked about. So to get things started, you know, um, you know, wh what does shared decision-making mean to you, Annette? Well, it, it would mean that I'd be part of the decisions that are being made about my care, not just uh, being a person at the appointment agreeing with everything the doctor told me I should do. Right. And, and have you ever, you know, sort of seen shared decision making in action or like, what does well, that look like? Or what's well, that? At, yeah, thank you. At first, I was one of those really agreeable people. And uh, I didn't want to disagree with anything the doctor said. And in fact, I didn't know enough to play much of a part. Um, but at one point, um, and I, I guess in the in the past 10 years, I had asked the doctor about a more effective treatment. And after um, a few appointments, he did agree with me. And he gave me the choice of three different drugs that he thought would be effective. And he outlined briefly um, how they were given, um, how frequently. And I was able to pick the one that fit in with my lifestyle. Um, for example, um, I was working full time when I made this choice and going every week for an infusion at a hospital center uh, just wouldn't have fit into my time schedule. Right, right. I know. I think I've, I've been, you know, in similar circumstances where, 
sometimes, you know, when there's a small choice like that, that you can make, you know, you know, a self-injectable <laughs> versus spending, you know, hours getting an infusion and then dealing with the side effects is much appreciated. You know, I had similar circumstance when my kids were young and, uh, you know, having to schedule that time in and a babysitter and, and all this really made a huge difference in my life for sure. Um, so I'd like to, you know, maybe go to the participants here. You know, we're using Slido. I don't know if any of you have experience in using it, but you basically just go to www.sli.do and you enter the code here for our, um, for our discussion here. So if you wanna just take a few minutes and maybe talk a little bit about what does shared decision-making mean to you? And I am going to sort of switch gears and go to Slido. Whoops and you'll be able to see the responses. Yeah. We'll just give ourselves a minute. Yeah, I'm gonna take a look too. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how things go. I'm gonna reload my page and see if anybody has any responses showing up yet. Equal partner in decisions, yes, aligning with values. I always find the values one a little more difficult to sort of comprehend, right? Like, I guess it's sort of like, what do we value? What's more important to us, I guess, as patients, you know? Uh, a recent example I've heard used with that one, but I don't know, like, Annette, if you have anything to add there, but uh, about what the values sort of mean to you. What it makes me think of is, is I know there are a lot of people who, who feel it's important not to take drugs, but, but I, I mean, I've been faced with that. People saying well, what you need to do is diet and exercise, um, power of the mind. But, but I've always felt that I would follow um, the advice of my doctor and mm -hmm. work on my diet, work on my exercise and see what happens. Um, values, values is, is a hard one to, um, to, to choose if you're not a values oriented person. All I wanted to do was be better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, I think there's some more coming up. I'll share back. Yeah. Sometimes I say I'm an, I'm, I'm an advertisement for pharma because I managed to work right still going strong, where when I was first diagnosed, the treatment was take, take 12 aspirin a day. Right. So I, that classifies me as an old timer. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm having a hard time going back to my screen here, but <laughs> I'm trying mm. to load the... Uh, uh, yeah, great points. Yeah. So I'm just going to go back to my uh, slides, being listened to and offered choice, coming to a decision together, frank and open discussion. Yeah, I've always found it interesting, too, that it talks about the relationships, right? Uh, I think you, you I, I think that's a bit of a prerequisite, I guess, to having shared decision making in, in action, you know, to me, um, by or with patients. Oh, lots of great responses here frank and open discussion and that sort of thing. Well, I might go on to, you know, uh, the, the next question, I think it was from our perspective here, um, you know, have you experienced shared decision-making in action and, and what did it look like? So that's actually the next poll up. So uh, you wanna move forward and give us some of your answers to that just to help us get thinking about what it looks like, uh, you know, have we actually seen it in practice? Um, um, I think Annette, you, you gave us a good example where, you know, there were certain things that sort of suited your lifestyle to a greater extent than others. Um, yeah. And, oh. and as I progressed and as I learned more and read um, and found, found more outside of what my doctor was telling me, 
then I was better able to have a discussion with my doctor. Um, more like, I mean, I, I never wanted to be the captain of the ship and uh, I don't know enough to uh, manage my own care, certainly, but I really wanted to be the co-pilot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, with, you know, it's nice to really have some choices, right? Because I think living yeah. with arthritis really takes away a lot of our choices day to day. So I think that's why it would be really nice to see shared decision making, you know, there to a greater extent to kind of give you a sense of feeling a little bit in control of your life and your health and, and, and these sorts of things, because so often it, it yeah. takes those choices away, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so many times, you know, you try a new drug and the, the drug doesn't work um, or it doesn't work for you or it makes you sick. Those aren't choices. Those are, um, that's life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. I spent too much time waiting for the, the miracle cure. Um, mm. Now I know there isn't one. Yeah. Definitely. Unless you're really lucky. Definitely. So on that note, I think, you know, we have, we, you know, we helped set the stage a little bit, I think, with, from a patient perspective here, um, I think it might be a good time to sort of move on to our first presentation. So I think I will try to find a way to stop sharing and give control over to Drs. Claire Barber and Glenn Hazelwood, who will tell us a little bit about some of the research and some of the, the projects that they've worked on um, to, you know, use shared decision making and some of their research in rheumatology and in practice, in fact. So I'm pleased to introduce, you know, Claire Barber, who is an assistant professor, rheumatologist and researcher at the University of Calgary, and a research scientist with Arthritis Research Canada. She has a special interest in rheumatoid arthritis and quality of care. And Dr. Glenn Hazelwood is also a rheumatologist, associate professor of medicine at the University of Calgary. His research focuses on medication effectiveness and safety. Uh, patient preferences and clinical practice guidelines in rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. So without further ado, I will pass it on to you folks for the next 15 minutes. So thanks so much. Hi, thanks so much, Lori. Can everybody hear me okay? Hear and see? Perfect. Okay. So today we're going to be talking a little bit more about what, what is shared decision making and what are patient decision needs. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Glenn. He'll give some examples of some patient decision aids that we've been involved in. And then we'll discuss a, a study we did to look at some of the barriers to the use of decision aids and, and really what can we do about it to try and get them um, into use. So as we heard in this um, nice fireside chat, um, in rheumatoid arthritis, there's many, many different um, treatment decisions that need to be made. So really as a, as a, as a team, as a rheumatologist and a patient, really our goal is to try and get um, our patients into remission or, or low disease activity. And this is the recommended treatment strategy for rheumatoid arthritis. So there's frequent visits, frequent escalation of treatment as needed to reach this target. And as you can imagine along this journey from the time of diagnosis, there are many treatment decisions to make. So what is preference sensitive care? So this is where there may be two or more valid options for treatment and really the best choice depends on patient's values. I thought that was a really interesting discussion um, about what, what values um, meant and we can certainly take some time at the end to, to really um, hear some more perspectives on it, but it's a, a common, commonly used term in the, in the literature when we talk about preference sensitive care and even shared decision making. So preference sensitive choices that are in RA care include uh, a myriad of choices. So the initiation and selection of initial treatment, um, initial DMAR treatment, um, for example, people might have choices about whether or not um, they might choose oral or subcutaneous methotrexate route, um, when and how to escalate to advanced therapy, um, selecting between advanced therapies, and those are just a few of the potential choices. And decisional conflict refers to personal uncertainty about which option to choose when the decision involves any risk, loss, regret, or challenge to values. 
And people may experience this as feeling like they don't know what to do, feeling uncomfortable with the decision, wavering between choices, preoccupied with the decision, putting it off, distressed or tense, questioning values or worried about undesired outcomes. And so how do we manage decisional conflict? Well, there's been a variety of ways to try and address this, um, including trying to increase knowledge, providing resources. And one of these types of resources that we'll talk more about in this um, discussion is uh, decision aid, trying to clarify a patient's values. So what, what are their values when it comes to taking um, medications in the right, in the route? Um, what are their concerns about potential risks? Um, we look at providing decision support, sometimes through decision coaching, and this may happen with our allied health team uh, providers who are invaluable in this uh, particular area, and also through discussing expectations of treatment and what happens if those are not met. So this is one of the, the standard um, kind of definitions of shared decision making. We heard a, a lovely one earlier um, in, in the presentation, but it really involves this very deliberate effort to involve patients in treatment and care choices in a way that it, again is incorporating their, their preferences. And again, there's this word values that I, I'd love to chat more about at the end. So how do we do this? Um, so the team in Ottawa has done a lot of uh, research on this, sort of breaks this down into a variety of steps and looks at it as a way of, of providing structured assistance to help patients deliberate and choose between their options while taking into consideration the best available evidence as well as their, their values. So the first step is really clarifying what the decision is. The second is really assessing a person's decisional needs. Are they somebody who needs and needs and wants a lot of information about this or and, and what type of information and how they'd like to receive it? Um, providing the information in the way that the patient would like to receive it and clarify that person's personal values. And then enhancing social support and resources um, and then monitor and facilitate the decision process. And so decision aids are a tool and they really focus on a specific, a specific decision for patients with a diagnosis or condition. So for example, and this is where we've done some work is looking at the initial uh, disease modifying anti-rheumatic drug or DMARD treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, but there are many other decisions as we've highlighted in, in the journey for patients living with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's uh, geared to try and prepare patients to engage in shared decision-making it supplements a physician's counseling. It helps explain the decision and the options and describes the benefits, harms, and uncertainties of these options and helps patients clarify their values to come to a decision. So it's been lots of evidence and this is um, uh, the reference of, uh, below is a Cochrane systematic review of decision aids and, and uh, demonstrating their, their benefits. So they enhance patient's knowledge, they enhance their accuracy of risk perceptions they help align the values and decisions, um, patients' values with the decisions being made. Um, they improve decision satisfaction and they also help improve patient physician communication. They decrease um, sort of any conflict or just what's called decisional conflict. Um, and they decrease indecision about personal values and they decrease the proportion of patients who are making more passive decisions. So just um, maybe doing what the doctor says, for example and really trying to focus on what is important for them. So next I'll hand it over to uh, Glenn Hazelwood who will uh, discuss the, um, some of the decision aids we've um, used. And Glenn, I can forward the slides for you. Okay, perfect, thanks, Claire. Um, okay, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So I, we're just gonna highlight a, f a couple of the um, decision tools that um, Claire and I have been uh, working together on along with um, lots of others. So this is one for um, early rheumatoid arthritis treatment. And we're just showing it as an example to, to show what is a decision aid. And so at the top, um, it starts by identifying the question. So this is for uh, people with newly diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis and whether you should take methotrexate on its own or in combination with other medications. Uh, and this has been, the reference for this is at the bottom there. Um, and then it uh, provides some background on rheumatoid arthritis, some uh, information on treatments and identifies who the tool's for and why the discussion is important. You can click next, Claire. Uh, and then this is the, the second page. And um, we really designed this tool to be a simple version that can supplement uh, physician patient discussion. So we really tried to keep it as short as possible. So this is a, a two page version. 
And so these are, this is the page that outlines the, the different um, trade-offs. So the risks and benefits and the dosing and other considerations that uh, are important for the decision. Uh, so you can see at the top, there's the, the benefits in terms of will my symptoms improve? And then it shows uh, some of the different possible side effects, uh, how they're taken. So the dosing options or lifestyle impacts. And then there's a space for questions at the bottom. So um, so we, we envision this being one being used at the encounter, but also being used uh, uh, ahead of the encounter or sort of after that by patients where they can kind of take it home and reflect on it a bit more. And then there's a, um, as Claire was mentioning, there's a, one of the outcomes is decisional conflict. And so there's a scale at the bottom to measure that. You can click next, Claire. Um, shared decision-making um, uh, is also needs to be tailored to the context uh, it's being delivered. So um, I see actually Valerie's on the call. So she's, um, so that's great. So she's actually taking this decision aid and adapting it for use in um, urban indigenous women as kind of uh, as a first step. So that work is ongoing. So um, yeah, the idea is to make this um, as culturally uh, sensitive um, uh, as, uh, as it can be. Yeah, next slide. This is an, another example. This is um, uh, one we did with, the, with Kappa. So we worked, uh, the, this was a collaboration between the CRA and Kappa to develop this uh, decision tool around COVID vaccination. Um, and as people know, there was a lot of sort of questions about it and the safety and the, the side effects, et cetera, that people had. Um, so we developed this and this is available. Um, it's through CAPA's website and then also on the, the CRA. Um, you can go to the next slide. And it essentially just outlines the, um, the benefits and uh, what to know if you have an autoimmune disease. Yeah, you can go next, Claire. Um, and we've made it, um, yeah, we've, we've made it available to, uh, freely available and people can modify it as needed if they just um, uh, ask permission. Um, so that what we're working on now is to, we're developing uh, guidelines, we're developing rheumatoid arthritis and other guidelines to the CRA. And we're really trying to, we really think there's a, a role for decision aids that are linked to guidelines. So the idea would be that the guideline group develops uh, or decides after looking at the evidence and having the panel meeting um, with patients, which recommendations are most, is it most important to, to do shared decision-making on? So what are these preference sensitive decisions? And then developing decision tools to target those decisions. So uh, one that we showed is uh, sort of first treatment. There's another one, um, around uh, that we're going to be developing around reducing biologic treatment in people who are in sustained remission. So that's something we're working on right now. And then uh, another one around escalating treatment after you've, you know, if you haven't had a, a good response to the first line therapy um, and are escalating treatment to an advanced therapy, developing a decision tool around that. And that's what, when I speak to patients about shared decision-making, I try to emphasize that you know, we have so many more treatment options now that um, oftentimes it's not a, a matter of one that's a clear winner over the others, but it's a matter of more choices available to patients. And that's why it's important to sort of, to know what's important to, to individual patients when making decisions. And that's it. I'll pass it back to Claire, thanks. Thanks so much, Glenn. And so people might be wondering why they've not seen a lot of um, decision aids in, in common use. Sorry, that's my daughter in the background. Um, and so there's some, uh, there are some potential barriers and, and also some potential solutions to try and address some of these barriers. And, and we have um, uh, done some research on this in partnership with, um, with Kappa as well. So I'll just run through the study and the, it's been published. So it's available in ACR open this year. And so we had three phases to our study. In the first, we used the decision aid, the first one that Glenn um, outlined that looked at the four treatment options, including no treatment and the three methotrexate based treatment options 
of initial um, disease uh, modifying um, antirheumatic drug therapy for early RA. Uh, then we conducted some semi-structured interviews with healthcare providers working in rheumatology as well as people living with RA. And participants were invited to give feedback on the decision aid and also how to implement decision aids in general. We transcribed the interviews and analyzed it. Um, and in phase three, um, we mapped um, the themes that we got from the interviews to something called the behavior change wheel combi system, which I'll explain in a minute, um, and use it to really develop a list of recommended implementation strategies. And so again, in our uh, interviews, there were 15 healthcare providers and 15 people uh, living with RA from across Canada. Um, and so from these interviews, we developed sort of five lessons learned. And the first, which many of you may be familiar with, is that unfortunately, many people experience uh, paternalistic decision making, and it seems to be dominant practice compared to shared decision making. So this was a quote from one of the healthcare providers. And they said, I mean, whatever you decide as a physician, if you think triple therapy is best, why would you give them dual therapy or monotherapy? So this, this represents a big barrier that we need to try and address if we're gonna bring more shared decision making and using patient decision aids um, into practice. The second lesson was that people living with RA need emotional support and access to educational tools to facilitate particip participation in shared decision making, especially following initial diagnosis. And this is a representative quote. So um, this was from a patient living with RA. They said, and there's a difference between the, oh my God, what's happened to me? And the, okay, I get what's going on. And now what can we do? Uh, what do I need to understand? That, that takes time to get from A to B. And we heard it over and over again that the people um, after initial diagnosis may need some time to process before being able to fully participate in shared decision making. And lesson three was that there are many logistical barriers to shared decision making and patient decision aid implementation in current models of arthritis care. And for, for example, this is a patient living with RA. And they said, it's almost like your first diagnosis and treatment options. It's almost like a two part visit, I think. And so this, we heard this over and over again, and that unfortunately, because of the shortage of rheumatologists and the long wait, line, uh, wait times to get in to see people, and the need often to start people with um, treatment uh, right away to pre event, prevent uh, damage, uh, we need to really rethink um, some of the, the models of care um, in order to facilitate shared decision making while not um, causing other delays in the system by doing so. And so the, less, the fourth lesson was that flexibility is a necessity for successful implementation of patient decision aid. And this is from a healthcare provider. And they said, there's a bazillion ways that they could do things differently than me. So it's not only province dependent, but it's like center and clinic dependent. So if we're thinking about ways uh, to implement decision aids, we need to make sure that, uh, that, that it's in a more flexible way that could be tailored to different, the way that different people practice as well. And the fifth lesson was that healthcare providers unfortunately have limited interest in further training opportunities about shared decision making and patient decision needs. And so this was one healthcare provider who said, I feel it's pretty straightforward. I would feel that probably, you know, a really clear email notification, just introducing it would be appropriate. And so again, this represents a barrier that we need to potentially overcome. So we ended up um, mapping um, all of these onto what's called um, the behavior change wheel. And it's a way of really organizing um, potential barriers um, uh, and really understanding um, uh, sort of uh, things that we need to consider when developing effective implementation strategies. And so um, in the inner circle here, we have um, the three sort of domains of the behavior change wheel, including capability, opportunity, and motivation. In the inner um, part of the wheel here is just some examples of where we have um, matched um, some, some of the potential barriers for people living with RA. And in the outer circle, we've matched sort of the, the barriers that were identified um, uh, from the healthcare provider perspective. You may notice that there's quite a bit on this motivation end here, especially uh, on the physician side, including things like the preference for paternalistic decision-making um, and perception of shared decision-making is difficult to do in practice. Um, and so through that mapping, um, we were able to use that uh, framework to try and understand what types of interventions may be most successful in improving the uptake of decision needs. And we worked with um, uh, an implementation scientist as well as our patient partners and other uh, team members to try and outline some potential solutions. 
Um, the first included making decision aids directly available to patients, um, usually through websites, and also providing education to patients on shared decision making so they're more familiar um, with the potential steps and, and the fact that they you know, can participate as well in that. Um, the second was to create a shared decision-making curriculum in rheumatology. Uh, we felt it's unlikely that we're going to necessarily change practice for those individuals who've been in practice for, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, but this is certainly skills that our uh, rheumatology trainees need to be familiar with. The third is really thinking about how we can leverage allied healthcare team members as decision coaches. Many physicians said they didn't have time or they didn't have um, the ability in their busy clinics to do this, but um, in many centers there, there can be access or, um, to allied health team members who may be able to, to offload um, some of this and, and help support um, uh, patients while keeping uh, things like the clinic flow uh, moving along as well. Um, uh, there, we also wanted to make sure that decision aids were linked to living rheumatology guidelines because this also increases the physician likelihood of uptake um, to this and, and Glenn alluded to that earlier and there's work ongoing at the Canadian Rheumatology Association in this regard. Um, we also felt it was important to try and embed shared decision making through the use of these decision aids within care pathways. And ideally, these are embedded in, in electronic medical records so that if uh, physicians are thinking about prescribing things or if they want to document this, um, that this was used, that this can be easy and seamless with the care that's being provided and the tools that they have available at the point of care. And lastly, um, we still think that there's an important role for future research. And so designing future trials of shared decision-making in rheumatology to really evaluate these patient important outcomes. And as well, you know, the more evidence we have, the more likely we're gonna see increased uptake of this over time. And so we wanted to just um, thank our, our uh, research um, support and also the research team, again, highlighting the important role our uh, CAPA patient research partners have, have played in this work. I thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Claire. That was great. Or Claire and Glenn. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Glenn, you just uh, were a bit earlier on, but thank you so much. I think that's really interesting, uh, especially I, I think one of the key findings for me was the paternalistic decision making styles and how, uh, you know, you just can't convert everyone. So I'd be curious to see if anybody has any comments or questions about that uh, for later on. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. And I will move on to Corinne if you wanted to share your presentation. So our last guest is, is uh, Corinne, uh, Dr. Kadin Tupin april She is an associate professor in the School of Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Ottawa. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy and undertook graduate and postgraduate training in public health and epidemiology. She has research expertise in chronic disease management and shared decision making. And her work has included research in pediatric and adult rheumatology uh, with experience in developing clinical practice guidelines, patient decision aids, and self-management tools. So I will pass it on to you, Corinne. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, you're muted. Yes, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about shared decision making and patient decision aids in pediatric rheumatology. Um, I'll give the example of the GIA option map, um, but I think it's an example too that is not necessarily you know, only relevant to pediatric rheumatology. Um, so that's it. Um, okay, so I have no conflict of interest. Um, I've been funded by a few um, uh, health organizations. Um, and I have some roles such as the editor of the Cochrane Musculoskeletal Group and the co-chair of the OMRAC Shared Decision-Making Group. So this definitely, you know, changes my vision of things and how I do research. <laughs> so um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis um, is, um, happens in about three in a thousand children in Canada. Um, pain is a common symptom um, and it has a big impact on quality of life and on a wide variety of um, uh, daily activities. Um, there's also a need for a multidisciplinary approach to treat this pain, um, as well as to treat the disease in general. Um, there's a lot of children who use a lot of different types of um, treatments, such as uh, complementary and alternative medicine, for example. And so we, we wondered uh, if decision making for all these different treatments was optimal. Um, and so this was kind of what started this project. 
So just a little quick update, you know, shared decision making um, is not really optimal in pediatric rheumatology. So there's been a few studies looking at that. Um, most of the studies were targeting really um, arthritis medication and um, most specifically DMARDs, um, so disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, however, there hasn't been a lot of research on the other types of treatments that um, youth and their parents use um, for their different um, symptoms such as pain. So for example, all the non-pharmacological options that they can use. Um, one of the decision aid that exists um, in pediatric rheumatology is the GIA medication choice card. So this is for disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. It was developed by PR Coin, um, which is a quality improvement network in the United States. So I'll show you an example of what it looks like. Um, and so in general, there's no patient decision aids that have been developed specifically for pain management or for the management of other symptoms. So they're taking all the medication, for example, you know, in order to control the disease to the maximum, but then they may still have pain, fatigue, stiffness, like other symptoms that um, they could use other, other treatments to help uh, alleviate. So I'll give you an example of the GIE medication choice cards just to show you a bit how it's used. So this is based on the uh, Mayo Clinic model of patient decision aids, um, which is a model which is used in a clinical consultation. So these are cards and based on what youth and parents value the most, they can pick the card that they wish to discuss. So for example, if it's more important to them, like the side effects, that's what really concerns them, then they could pick the card on side effects. Um, if they want to know how often this treatment, the, the, the treatments are, are given, then they would pick that card. And so it kind of starts a discussion with healthcare providers. So this is an example of the things to consider with the different types of um, DMARDs and biologics. So for example, not become pregnant, for example. So for some of them, it's, it's, it's more important than for others. Um, there's also the one on side effects. So this is an example of the different side effects. Um, and so this is really a discussion with the, you know, with the healthcare provider in the clinical consultation. So in general, what we wanted to know was, okay, what if they're taking, for example, the arthritis medication, but they still have pain? So what can they do for their pain? And how do they make decisions for their pain, right? And so what we did is we started here <laughs> at the bottom of the stairs, we started with a systematic review um, to look at how people make decisions. So we look at studies that looked at how youth and parents made decisions um, about pain management options. We also did interviews because we had no choice because the literature had little information. So we did interviews and from the interviews, we realized that there's really, there was a need for information on a wide range of treatments. So um, treatments that would include, for example, uh, you know, exercise and massage and uh, orthotics, all these treatments, uh, mostly non-pharmacological, um, you know, really families didn't have a lot of information on. So they really needed evidence-based information. They also wanted to have kind of help to discuss their values and their preferences. So what they prefer in terms of treatments with their healthcare provider. And in general, they didn't talk a lot about these symptoms and their treatments with healthcare provider. So pain, you know, they talked about pain if pain was really, really bad. But if they had pain once in a while and they kind of forgot about it, it was last week, then they didn't necessarily discuss it. So um, it was, there was really a need to discuss it with healthcare providers and to know more about it. Um, so we really determined that there was a need for a web-based patient decision aid for pain management. Web-based because it would be easy to use. So it would be a link like a website. They could go on it. They could get information, try to see what is important to them, which is a, a part of patient decision aid that is very important, and try to find kind of what suits best their needs. Um, and then discuss it with their healthcare providers um, using kind of a summary of what they put in the app. And so that's how we decided to develop the GIE option map. So we did systematic searches of the evidence because we wanted to know, okay, what's the evidence for the different treatments, you know, um, to, to actually manage pain. And so that took us a while um, because we didn't just look at juvenile arthritis because there's not a lot of information. And so we had to actually look at other um, information um, um, actually for adults with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so we asked our experts or clinicians or patients, okay, if there's a, a randomized control trial on yoga, 
but it's in young adults with our rate, would we include that or not, right? And so often they said like, yes, you know, it's better to have a bit more information, but we should just know it's in our rate and not in GIA. Um, we then did a few consensus meeting um, at a meeting in the US. Uh, so as part of the CARA group, which is a research network on pediatric rheumatology. So we had a few consensus meetings, like three years in a row. So we presented, you know, what we wanted to do and clinicians and patients um, gave us their opinion on what we should put in the decision aid. Um, and then we worked on it and then we present, presented what we had the next year. We did interviews also where we developed and we tested a paper prototype. So we put like a paper version of what we thought it would look like. And then after that, we developed a web application. Um, and that one, we then tested it. So right now we're kind of finishing to test it uh, with people who are using it um, on their phone or on their computer, um, using Zoom and sharing their screen and showing us you know, if they think it's clear and if they like the app. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so the patient decision aid was uh, developed um, following a process that is um, discussed uh, on the website of the International Patient Decision Aid Standard. So it's kind of a standardized way to develop patient decision aid. So the paper-based prototype has five steps, and I'll show you the steps uh, very soon. Um, and so these steps were really liked by uh, patients and clinicians um, and parents, and so well, we, we kept it in the web application. Um, they also said that, okay, there's a lot of options. So we have now 39 treatment options for pain management. And so they're like, we don't want to have 39 options and go through all 39. And so they wanted to have a computer algorithm that would kind of say like, okay, if you have pain here, and if you prefer using treatments that help you relax, then it would show you a few options that you might like the most. And so that's what we did. So we develop an algorithm with clinicians and, and patient partners. Um, and then we made improvement, uh, you know, to the content and format, and we published a paper um, that described the development of the paper version. The next step was to develop the um, web application. So this is like a website. It's, it's a link. Um, so people click on it. So here um, it's the beginning of the, the app. So you have juvenile idiopathic arthritis. You still have pain even if you take your arthritis medication, and you want to find ways to manage your pain. So this is why they would use the GIE option map. So these are the five steps. Uh, many of the patient decision aids uh, developed in Ottawa have these steps. Um, and so there's a patient decision aid for osteoarthritis that is online. Um, so if you go to Ottawa um, or Cochrane, it's on the Cochrane website as well. Um, and you say osteoarthritis stepped decision aid, you will probably find it. So it's a bit the same steps. So first describe your pain and the treatment you're using. Second, clarify what is important to you when managing your pain. And then the third step is based on where you have pain, <clears throat> as well as what is important to you, then there's going to be a top three options of the things that you could try on your own. So kind of self-care, things that are not really dangerous, so you could do on your own. And then a top three of things you can discuss with your healthcare team. So usually all the medications are there, um, as well as, for example, treatment that you need a referral to access. Uh, and then you can, you know, you review, you choose the treatments you prefer, and then you make your plan. And then you can, you have a summary that shows everything, and then you can print it or show it on your phone or computer uh, to your healthcare providers. So this is an example of, you know, pictures of the app. So this is what it looks like on the phone, but on the, on the computer, it looks a little bit different. So this is like where they have pain, depending on where you have pain, you click. Here it's some of the treatments, for example, um, some of the ways to ask about um, your values and preferences. So it is, import is it important to relieve pain immediately as soon as possible? So we actually, in the algorithm, you know, each of the treatment we put, um, for example, if it's a treatment that's gonna work fast or not, or if it's a pain medication and you wish to avoid a pain medication, then it would skip these. Same thing it asked about, um, do you want a treatments to help you relax, treatments that helps you uh, be physically active. So based on that, it will show um, the treatments you prefer. And if you want a bit of everything, it's gonna make, put a mix of everything. So this is an example of what it looks like. So you have your results, and this is the top three treatments, for example, you can try right now. 
Um, there's also a, a tab for all treatments. So you can see the 39 treatments in different categories. So for example, you have the splints and orthotics, you have physical activity, you have physical treatments, you have pain medication, you have nutrition also. Uh, and finally, you have my favorites. So every time you like something, you can just click on the little heart and then it puts in your favorite and then you make your plan. So this is examples of treatments. When um, you click on the treatments, you can see this. So this is an example for Pilates. So you have the green, it seems to be effective and safe. So experts suggest that, you know, it's important to participate in regular physical activity. So because of that, it is a green treatment. So some of the treatments like, for example, opioids are red because there are some side effects. And so we explain why. Um, and there's also some that are yellow. That could be not necessarily appropriate to your situation, but that could be a good fit. Um, and does it work? So here we put the studies that we found. So here there's a study, for example, of 50 youth with juvenile arthritis. And so they tried Pilates versus uh, general exercise program. And we show how much people improve in each group. They can also, with the little eye here, they could go to the PubMed link and access the link to that study. You make your plan. So you, you decide what treatment you're gonna use. Then uh, you put how motivated you are, how confident, uh, and then it shows actually, it asks you about the barriers. What are the barriers um, you know, to doing this? And so depending on what you write, it's gonna give you a little advice. And then summary to share. So you have a summary, then it puts everything. So it puts about like your, your pain, where your pain has been, what you've used, what are your preferences, and then what you decided to choose. So this is just an example, but I could have shown it also going through the app, but uh, I decided not to do this for this short presentation. Uh, so the web app in general was shown to be easy to navigate. So we tested it now with five youth and five parents, but we're continuing uh, to test it. And so they, they liked it. They thought it would improve decision-making. Um, a lot of them said that there's some treatments that they didn't know about that are in the app. Some of them said also there's treatments that they tried, but it took them like months and months to say, oh, should I try it? And they said, by looking at the app, they're like, oh, you know, we tried it and it worked in the end. But here we see if we had this, we would have been kind of, we would have tried it maybe earlier, right? So like orthotics, for example, or just good uh, footwear, for example. Um, and so there's interest from allied healthcare providers, um, such as occupational therapists and physiotherapists to use it. Um, so that's interesting. And then the goal is this could be used with decision coaching. Uh, I think that was already mentioned uh, by Claire and Glenn. Um, so with decision coaching, which is really a not, it, 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 you know, it's not about someone telling you, you should do this. It's more about, let's find out what's better for you. And based on what's better for you, what do you want to do? And so I think that this would have a lot of potential. Um, I think, um, you know, I think the goal is this people can do outside of the clinical uh, encounter, but then by thinking about all these things beforehand, a lot of the participants said, oh, it's good because I think about all these things and I get the information and then I come in and I'm prepared to talk about it. Now, the question is gonna be, you know, do we need to give additional training to healthcare providers? Um, because I think for a lot of these treatments, some of the healthcare providers were like, oh, that's great, but I don't know who to refer to for these treatments. So that's gonna be another, I think, layer of complexity. So we're really hoping to finalize it um, and we're going to evaluate the web app over time with decision coaching. Uh, we also want to add mental health symptoms and participation in meaningful daily activities. So not make it just about pain, but other aspects that are not discussed so much right now. And I mean, the goal is to modify it for other chronic conditions. So there's people interested, for example, in adult musculoskeletal pain um, in order to reduce opioid use. So it's a lot of work, I find. It took us a a long time to do. Um, but I think the implementation is going to be also a lot of work as well. Um, so we have a lot of people, you know, included. So we worked a lot with Kappa, with Lori Prou, and we have a team of um, patient partners who are amazing. Um, we also did with, you know, Lori Prou and Kappa, and we did a lot in terms of like social media and YouTube, and we have a, a, a website. So slowly, we're getting kind of, you know, we want people to know about it so that we could test it further and help implement it. Because that's always like the hardest part. <laughs> so thank you. 
Thank you so much, Karen. Yes, and, and I think CAP has been really lucky to be involved in both of these projects. And, you know, uh, some of our board members are involved in Karen's work as well. It's not just me, but the, you know, Don Richards, who's also on our board, is involved with Glenn and Claire on their projects. So anyways, and just like it's a great thing, you know, to uh, I think I see so much potential for shared decision making um, to improve care for patients to make them feel like they have a little bit more control over things. So thank you both so or, or thank you all three of you. <laughs> Sorry so much for coming today. We do have a bit of time uh, for questions. I've tried to add in a few in the chat and that, but um, you know, feel free to add them in here or if you want to unmute and, and add things in. But I, 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 I might start with the ones that I do see and, and kind of pass it over to all of you to uh, talk about. So um, Annette was talking about whether there's a pathway or a common route for newly diagnosed patients to start to educate themselves. Um, it does seem like you need to be sort of, you know, have some knowledge, right, to sort of participate. I, I would see, like, at least to me, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, like an expert in the research and what it says, but it does seem like you would have to have a certain amount of knowledge and I guess hence the benefit of some of these decision aids, but, you know, are, would any of you know of any sort of pathway or sort of information patients could use? Glenn, did you want to take that or? Um, yeah, sure I can. Yeah, we're, um, it's, it's very true. Um, there's lots of decision aids that have been developed, but they tend to be, um, you know, maybe scattered around and not sort of collated in a central place where people can access. So that's something that we're, we're, the three of us are actually working on looking at, you know, can we get these decision aids from different groups, have them posted in a central place that then, then can be supported through the CRA and patient groups and, and kind of a central hub for them. Right, sounds good. Ken, I don't know, Ken, if you had anything else to add or if that just helps answer for everyone <laughs> since you're all working together. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to say, I was looking at the comments too. I think it's funny because I've given a few presentation on the inf health information in general, and I've talked about patient decision aids, and I find a lot of people in the public don't know about patient decision aids. And there's, for example, the Ottawa patient decision aid group. They have a list of patient decision aids for a few different um, uh, health issues, right? Um, but the thing is also like, we need to kind of make, we need to prepare healthcare providers to receive patients in a way that is open-minded. And, you know, because like there's some people who told us like, oh, I would love to use this patient decision aid. And I, but then they're really afraid of what their clinicians will say. Like, oh, you're thinking of taking this? Like, why are you thinking, you know? So I think we, and we need more power to the patients, but we need healthcare providers to kind of give a bit of that power back to patients, mm -hmm. which they've kind of taken. Um, yeah, and I think it would be good to have like one place where you would have these patient decision aids. And Glenn and Claire, I think we, you know, we have different decision aids at different, um, I guess for different treatment options, right? And there's different steps, right? It's like a process, right? So I really see this as a process of you could use a patient decision aid at this point before meeting with your physicians, then during, then after. And what about, I think, non-pharmacological options as well, right? Which are often not discussed at all, right? And I think we need to also educate allied health professionals because often they I think they want to help but it is very hard to keep up to date on all the studies um so yeah yeah right yeah and sometimes there's some you know you know reluctance I guess because patients can you know take to google and finding lots of information there right so it, that's what I see as a big at least from my perspective some real uh, you know amazing value from these decision aids because they've been vetted and they've you know they they kind of meet the sort of gold standard for health information um Mary Bracaniak actually here is talking about are you are are any of you aware of any education modules on shared decision making and Canada uh, for, you know, I guess med school or allied healthcare pro professionals, um, you know, she too, I think recognizing sort of the changing culture needed. So don't know, uh, Kat in if you wanted to start with that one or if you have anything to ask. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, one of the things, so I was teaching medical school students um, in Ottawa and, uh, and we did a few, we did like some um, fourth year, um, fourth year kind of, um, you know, 
internship, I don't know how to say, sorry, <laughs> kind of fourth year lectures. And it's funny because often you talk to, so often it's either, oh, I know about it. I'm already doing it or I'm going to do it. I've seen it in practice, it happens. Or it's like, there's no way I can do this. And sometimes they say, you go to the dark side after you leave. Like, this is what, what some med students have told me. So, it, you know, maybe what they see in during their training and then how they apply it in practice is very different. I think for OTs, physios, it's a bit the same. Sometimes there's something they learn in, in, in university and then they go to clinic and then they see something totally different being done. And then they're kind of, what do I do? Um, one of the things is, uh, the, yeah, there's the um, uh, there's a training, the Ottawa Decision Support is it Decision Support Tutorial. It's the training um, on the if you go to Ottawa Patient Decision Aid, there's a tutorial, but it's a few hours long. So, right, yes, yeah, and I think Claire, you've mentioned here there's a, a website with an inventory of of shared decision making in healthcare. I don't know if you want to. I could click on it, but maybe you could tell us briefly about it. Yeah, no, we were um, doing some sort of background research for the paper that, that we had uh, produced. This was a, uh, I did come across some work from uh, a team in Laval who developed sort of a website that has an inventory of shared decision making kind of um, resources for healthcare providers. Um, at the, when we reviewed it, it did not appear to, to my take on it that there was anything particularly for rheumatoid arthritis necessarily, although uh, they, it may not kind of capture capture everything. Um, certainly at the Royal College level, so you know um, they, they have a whole bunch of different competencies that are listed for healthcare providers that they need to kind of demonstrate in order to become physicians in Canada. And um, certainly shared decision making is listed there, but um, I think in in many of our kind of personal experiences, the way that it's um, sort of practiced and, and taught, um, especially as they get into rheumatology, it, it's, it, it, you know, it may be less, less formal and more informal. And so it depends on who you work with or who you're training. With. So I think that's something that, that needs to, to change. And that was one of, again, the things that we were listing in our, our kind of strategy to help, help make change and bring about change in this in, in rheumatology in particular. Yeah. No, definitely. I, I mean, and, and I mean, just on a personal level, I've sort of experienced everything under the sun from, you know, having someone that just tells me what to do and to, you know, I'm the one showing up and being perhaps, you know, very active in my care, let's just say that, and trying to really lead the discussions. So definitely a great for, for a variety of experiences there, but uh, nice to see all of this work going on, frankly. Um, to sort of help, you know, evolve um, clinical practice, you know, to help patients really at the end of the day. So I thank you all so very, very much for coming here today and, and sharing what you're trying to do to, I guess, push the envelope a little bit and support shared decision-making in practice and beyond. So thanks again. And I think with that, I know I, I could have probably asked even more questions, but just cognizant of our time. And, uh, you know, I think we've respected the one hour perfectly and lots of thanks in the chat box to you from the other participants as well. So I will share with everybody the final link uh, to this on our YouTube channel so we can share beyond just whoever could attend today. So thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.